Hello everyone, welcome to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to provide some geometric intuition about correlation. We're going to show that random variables can be interpreted as vectors within a certain vector space, which is a little bit weird the first time you hear about it, and that the covariance can be interpreted as an inner product between those vectors. This geometric intuition is going to allow us to rederive some of the important properties of the correlation coefficient that we derived in previous videos, and it's also going to allow us to gain a more geometric understanding of the simple regression problem. Let's get started. We're going to provide a geometric analysis of covariance, and the idea is that we're going to think of random variables as vectors that have a certain direction within a certain space, which again sounds a little bit weird the first time you hear about it, but it's very useful to build intuition about correlation. Let's remember what a vector actually is mathematically. We often think of vectors as just a list of numbers, and those are vectors in a Euclidean space. So for example, you know, the vector 2, 3 is a vector in R2. But what do we actually mean when we say a vector in mathematics? What we mean are objects that admit two operations. You can always sum two vectors together, and the sum is um, commutative. v1 plus v2 is equal to v2 plus v1, and um, an associative. Okay, So you do v1 plus v2 first, that's the same, and then add it to v3. That's the same as doing v2 plus v3 and then adding it to v1. Okay, We need that for a vector sum to be like a, a proper vector sum. The other thing that we need for vectors is to be able to scale them by multiply them by multiplying them by a real number. Okay, well, in this case, we're going to restrict ourselves to real numbers. In some cases, the numbers can be com complex, but let's not get carried away. And that multiplication um, has to be associative. Okay, so if we scale the vector and then we scale it again, that's the same as multiplying the two scalars and then scaling the vector using that um, that coefficient. Okay, so that's all we need for a vector to be actually a vector in mathematics. We need to be able to sum these objects that we call vectors, and we have to be able to scale these objects that we call vectors. A vector space is a set of vectors that satisfy some properties. Those properties are that for any vector and any scalar, if we scale the vector, then we get another vector that still belongs to the vector space. Okay, think of um, the real numbers if we multiply, actually the real numbers, like think of R2 of the plane. If we scale a vector in the plane, then the scaled vector always stays in the plane. The plane is a vector space. If we sum two vectors that belong to the vector space, the sum has to stay in the vector space. Again, two vectors on the plane, you sum them, the sum always stays on the plane. The plane is a valid vector space. And there must exist a zero vector such that if you sum it, if you add it to another vector, the vector stays the same. In the case of the plane, that would be the origin, the zero, zero, zero vector, the zero, zero vector, if we're talking about the 2D plane. Okay, so those are the conditions that a vector space must satisfy to be a valid vector space. And, oh, I forgot one, there always has to be an inverse, meaning that you can always subtract another vector from a vector to go back to the origin. Okay, you, there's always this inverse, min, which we call minus v, such that when you add it to a certain vector, you end up with a zero vector, which in the case of the plane is the origin. If some set of objects that can be summed and scaled satisfy these conditions, they are a vector space no matter how weird those objects might be. And I say that because it turns out that uh, the random variables actually are a vector space. In order to establish that random variables are a vector space, we have to explain, well, we have to define when a random variable is equal to another random variable. So notice that it's not uh, sufficient for them to have the same distribution because I can have two independent random variables that have the same distribution we, it doesn't make sense to say that they are the same, right? Instead, we're going to say that two random variables are the same if the event that they take the same value has probability 1. So with probability 1, A is always equal to B. Okay? 
If that is the case, then we say that the two random variables are the same. We're going to call R the set of random variables associated to a certain probability space. Well, it turns out that if you scale the random variable by any number, we obtain another random variable which is also in the probability space. We're not going to give like a, formally, a formal proof of this, which would require, for example, in the case of continuous random variables, showing that this guy is measurable and you know, like the inverse images are all in the probability space and so on. But it doesn't, it's not super complicated, but it's beyond the scope of this video. We don't want to have, we don't want to get carried away with the mathematical details. Uh, you can trust me on this one that if you scale a random variable, it's going to still stay a random variable, we, like related to the same probability space. Um, same thing with the sum. If we sum two random variables, which we have, you know, which we do sometimes in the course very happily, they stay a random variable and you can actually prove this for continuous random variables. It gets a little bit more complicated. Okay, and finally, there is a random variable that is natural to interpret as the zero vector, uh, which is the random variable that is equal to zero with probability one, because when we add it to another random variable with probability one, that random variable stays the same because we're adding zero. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So we have this concept of the zero random variable. So what is going to be our inverse? Just what we obtain by multiplying each random variable by minus one when we do the random variable minus itself, that's going to be equal to zero with probability one. So we have a concept of inverse within this vector space of random variables. If this is the first time you encounter this notion of calling something that is not an actual vector as a list of numbers, um, a, vector, a vector in a vector space, this gets a little bit used to, but the idea is that we can establish an analogy. This is how you have to think about it, okay? So now you can think of random variables as belonging to some space and we could think of them as vectors. This analogy is valid because of all of these properties being satisfied. Okay, that's the idea. And we're going to see some concrete consequences in a moment. But first we have to um, further, like we have to establish some more tools to describe vectors within a vector space. A very, very important tool is the inner product because the inner product essentially allows us to characterize the angle between vectors, which is a very important property. So an inner product on a vector space is a valid inner product if it is symmetric. So if we do the inner product of V1 and V2, it's the same as the inner product of V2 and V1, and it's linear. If we compute the inner product of a scaled version of V1 this is the, and V2, this is the same as computing the inner product and then multiplying by um, by that scaling factor. So the scaling factor can come out. If we compute the inner product between a sum and a third vector, then we can actually separate this into a sum of the inner products. Okay, so the inner product is linear in that sense. And finally, the inner product must be positive semi-definite. That means that it's non-negative for any vectors non-negative if you do the inner product of the of a vector and itself that has to be non-negative because we will see that we're going to use this as a proxy for the squared length of the vector and if that if the inner product of the vector with itself is equal to zero then it has to be equal to the zero vector okay this is what it means for an inner product to be positive semi-definite so now what we're going to see is that we're going to have a valid inner product between random variables, but we're going to have to center the random variables for this to be an actual inner product. I'll explain in a moment why in particular we need to center the random variables. Okay, but assume that we're centering the random variables, they're zero mean. In that case, the covariance is an inner product between random variables, which is kind of natural, right? Because think of the covariance between zero mean random variables, it's just the mean of the product. Okay, so the mean of the product is an inner product. That's not a huge surprise, perhaps. Okay, so let's establish that the covariance is symmetric. Let's take a look at the covariance between A and B. That's uh, the mean of centered A times centered B. We can just switch, right? Because this is just a normal product, which is commutative. So um, we, we commute it. And then what is this equal to? It's the covariance between B and A. 
so the covariance is symmetric even if the random variables are not centered. What about linear? What's the covariance of beta i times b? So just by definition, beta i minus its mean times b minus its mean, we take the expected value or the mean. Now, because of linearity of expectation, beta can come out, right? Because it's multiplying these two terms, we get beta times the covariance between a and b. Okay, so um, in that sense, it is linear. We still need to check that the sum, the covariance of the sum of two uh, random variables with a third random variable is equal to the sum of the covariances. And that does happen because um, here we have, we're, we're using a slightly different definition of the covariance here as the mean of the products minus the product of the means. We saw that this was equivalent to this definition by linearity of expectation. Now the, we can just expand this by linearity of expectation again into um, the product, the mean of the product between A1 and B minus the product of the means plus the mean of the product between A2 and B minus the product of the means. So indeed, this is equal to the sum between the two covariances. Finally, the more tricky property, these two properties hold even if the random variables are not centered. The more tricky property is that the, the covariance is positive semi-definite. This will happen for zero mean random variables because the covariance of a random variable with itself when the random variable is zero mean is equal to the mean square. And when a random variable uh, has mean square equal to zero, this implies that the random variable is equal to zero with probability one. This follows from Chebyshev's inequality and we will establish it more rigorously a little bit later on. But for now, maybe trust me, this is why we need zero mean random variables to actually build a covariance that is a valid inner product. Okay, so we did a lot of work, but now we're going to reap our rewards of checking that random variables are a valid vector space and the covariance is a valid inner product because now we can define a length of a random variable in general, the length of a vector is um, the product of the vector with itself, and then we take a square root. So for a random variable, we take the covariance of the random variable with itself, and we take a square root. That's the square root of the variance, which is equal to the standard deviation. So in this space of random variables, the length of a random variable is its standard deviation. The more a random variable fluctuates on average, the longer is the corresponding vector in our analogy. We can also, establish, uh, we can also um, define an angle between vectors, and in particular, the cosine of an angle between vectors. So in case you don't remember your linear algebra, the cosine of the angle between two vectors is just equal to the inner product normalized by their lengths. So in the case of random variables, what do we do? Well, we write the inner product, which is the covariance, and we divide by the lengths with just the standard deviations. What is this quantity? This quantity is the correlation coefficient between the two random variables. So the correlation coefficient can be interpreted as the cosine of the angle between the two random variables. In order to stop like doing this with my hands, which is probably confusing and not very clear, let me show you a picture. We're saying that we can interpret random variable A as a vector with length equal to the standard deviation and random variable B as a vector with length equal to its standard deviation. And what we're saying is that the angle between them is equal to the correlation coefficient. So if the correlation coefficient is positive, that means that the cosine is positive. So the two vectors are pointing in the same direction. That's what we mean when we say that the, the um, random variables are correlated. Okay, if we look at correlation in this space, in this vector space of random variables, positive correlation means that the vectors are pointing in the same direction. If the cosine is negative, then this would look like this instead. Well, terrible picture. Let me make a better effort. Okay, so one would be going this direction. Oops. One would look like that and the other one would look like this. Wait, I'm not, I can't draw arrows because I'm in 
Okay, one would look like this and the other one would look like that. This is what happens when the cosine of two angles is negative. The, 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 the cosine of two angles. The cosine of, of the angle between two vectors is negative. That means that the vectors point in opposite directions. That in our analogy, the implication is that the correlation coefficient is negative, so the random variables are negatively correlated. What if the cosine is equal to zero? Then that implies, that implies orthogonality. And in our case, it implies uncorrelation between the two random variables. So you can see that it's kind of nice. Oh, and also I forgot to say that obviously the cosine of an angle is between minus one and one. So by this analogy, immediately we could have rederived very important properties about the correlation coefficient. First, it's between minus one and one because it's the cosine of this angle. Second, when uh, the when it's positive, vectors point in the same direction. When it's negative, vectors point in the opposite directions. And when uh, it's actually equal to one or minus one, they're completely collinear. I forgot to say this now. Okay? So if the correlation coefficient is equal to one, then the two vectors are on top of each other. And if it's equal to minus one, then they're collinear but pointing in opposite directions. Okay. So now we have the analogous statements for the correlation coefficient would recover a lot of the properties that we established in previous videos. If the correlation positive is positive, then the random variables are positively correlated. The vectors are pointing in the same direction. If the correlation coefficient is negative, the random variables are negatively correlated. The vectors point in opposite directions. And if the correlation coefficient is equal to minus one or one, then they are li completely linearly dependent, which means that the vectors lie on the same line. Finally, if it's equal to zero, then the vectors are orthogonal, which means that the random variables are uncorrelated because the correlation coefficient is equal to zero. So notice that this analogy is actually very powerful. It captures essentially every property that we derived about the correlation coefficient that it allows you to reason geometrically about them. What if we want to solve the simple regression problem? Okay, the simple linear regression problem. We want to estimate B as a linear estimate of A. Because here we're talking about centered random variables, basically we want to see how much we have to scale A. Okay, these are possible scalings to obtain the best possible estimate for B. If we want to uh, minimize the mean squared error in our vector space, the mean squared error is just the same as the variance of the random variable B minus beta A, which of course belongs to the vector space. It's a valid random variable and you can check that it has zero mean. Because it has zero mean, that's why it's equal to its mean square. And now what's the variance? It's the squared length in our analogy, right? The, the variance of a random variable is just the squared length. Because we said that when we define the length of the random variable as a vector, it's equal to the standard deviation. So we want to minimize the length of the difference between B and beta A. How do we minimize that? Well, how do you find the closest point to B that lies on this line? Because that's what we mean by uh, beta A, right? You are only allowed to stay on that line. Well, the point that is closest to B on this line is the one where the difference is orthogonal. This is just by simple geometry. Okay. So we want orthogonal, just to be clear. Okay. So here B minus beta A is orthogonal to A. So we need a beta such that this happens so that we get the closest point. Okay, and this will allow us to solve the simple linear regression problem because of this analogy between mean squared error and distance. So now we expand this out. This basically implies that a uh, that b times the inner product of a with itself, which is just the squared norm of a, is equal to the inner product between a and b. So b, the best beta is equal to the inner product divided by the squared norm of a. Now we're talking about random variables, right? So what is the inner product? It's the covariance. What's the squared length of A or the squared norm of A? It's its variance. So we get this expression for the linear coefficient that is actually just equal, exactly equal to 
the best linear coefficient of the linear minimum mean squared estimate of b given a that we have derived in previous videos. Okay, so this estimate that we find by just saying, oh, you know, the error should be orthogonal to the vector is exactly the minimum mean squared error estimate that we had derived previously. Okay, so that's, that's kind of cool. Immediately, by the way, we obtain that the residual is orthogonal with A and also with the linear estimator because it's a scaled version of A. We had proved this also previously um, when we were talking about residuals in linear, in simple linear regression. Okay, and also actually in when we are talking about decomposition of variance. Talking of which, talking about the decomposition of variance, because of this orthogonality, we can apply Pythagoras's theorem to this vector b, because it's decomposed into two orthogonal vectors, and by Pythagoras' Pythagoras's theorem, by Pythagoras's theorem, uh, the squared length of b is equal to the sum of squared lengths of the two vectors um, whose sum make up b. One of them is the linear estimate, the other one is the residual. But what are these guys in our analogy between random variables and vectors? They're just the variance. So we get the decomposition of variance that we had arduously de uh, derived in a previous video almost for free, just from Pythagoras' theorem. The variance of b is equal to the sum of the variance of the linear estimate and the residue. And now let's take a look at the linear estimate. What's the squared length of the linear estimate? Well, it's this beta times a, okay, and the norm of that squared. But now the beta can come out squared by just the properties of norms. So this immediately implies that um, the, the squared length of the linear estimate is equal to the square of the coefficient times the length of the vector, which is the variance of a. Here, these guys are going to cancel out, and we get that the fraction of the variance um, explained by the linear estimate, I should have written here that this is equal to the variance of the linear estimate, the fraction of variance explained by the linear estimate is equal to the squared of the correlation coefficient, and this just follows from this simple geometric argument. Again, we had proved this uh, using just the properties of covariance and random variables in a previous video. It comes out from this geometric intuition. Let's show you what I mean by a picture. So the length of b, the squared length of b is equal to the squared length of the residual plus the squared length of the linear estimate, and the squared length of the linear estimate is equal to, and here, of course, there always has to be a typo. This is 1 minus r because r is the square of the correlation coefficient. Okay, so we have this coefficient of determination that is the square of the correlation coefficient. And what we have shown is that geometrically the length of the linear estimate and um, the squared length, the fraction of squared length. So if you divide the squared length of B and the squared length of the linear estimate, you get R. So the length of the linear estimate is the square root of R times the variance of B. Again, these are all properties that we had derived mathematically in previous videos. It's kind of nice to see that they all follow from this analogy of interpreting random variables as vectors. So what have we learned? We have learned an interpretation of random variables as vectors, the covariance as an inner product between those vectors that allow us to start thinking about angles. And in that case, the, the, uh, the cosine between the angles is the correlation coefficient between the two random variables, which allows us to, in, to interpret correlation in terms of the direction in which the two vectors are pointing. Is it the same direction? Is it opposite directions? Are they orthogonal? And finally, we saw that we could actually rederive uh, the simple linear regression estimate by interpreting it as an orthogonal projection. And I haven't said this, but we also rederived this decomposition of variance and um, the fact that the coefficient of determination is the fraction of variance explained linearly um, 
uh, with another random variable. And that's all I got. Thank you very much.